So today I'm at Bio Europe with Anders Hinsby, uh, CEO of Orphozyme, um, a Danish company f focusing on orphan diseases. So welcome Anders, thank you for speaking to me today. Um, so I wonder if you could tell me what inspired you to uh, co-found Orphozyme. Yeah, so um, it's all the way back in 2009 now when I met with our Chief Scientific Officer Thomas Kierkegaard at a naming ceremony of uh, the daughter of a mutual friend. And we basically had two things we both wanted. We wanted to uh, apply our skills and sort of be, become hands-on in, in terms of uh, developing our careers. Thomas was at the time an academic mm -hmm. and I was actually working in a, in a venture fund at the time. Okay. So we wanted to do that and then we also wanted to do something non-incremental. Uh -huh. And Thomas, uh, my co-founder, he had a, a brilliant technology that he was developing yeah. at the Danish Cancer Society. Mm -hmm. And basically, uh, the inspiration for me was that he had a technology that would be ideally fit to do something dramatically new, potentially, for patients mm. uh, with, a, um, with a protein misfolding disease. Okay. There are many of them, some of them are orphan. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, so, could you tell a bit more about how, how you're actually targeting those diseases? Yeah, so fundamentally, our therapy relies on applying um, a family of proteins that we all have. Mm -hmm. uh, we call them cellular rescue proteins. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they're called heat shock proteins and what happens uh, when you have an acute, uh, when you experience acute stress, mm -hmm. uh, like a traumatic injury, uh, when you run a marathon, is that these, uh, in these situations of stress, you upregulate heat shock proteins and they protect mm. your other proteins in the cell and make sure that they remain functional. So what we wanted, and this is where, very well described mm -hmm. for, for decades now, it's been described in the literature. Uh, but what we wanted to do is uh, to develop this as an approach to treating diseases that develop over time, chronic diseases, okay. genetic diseases. Okay. Hmm. So um, I wonder, like, I know orphan diseases is becoming a bit of a, a buzzword in the last few years, and I wonder, if, you know, you've obviously been in the field now for a while. <coughs> I mean, how, how do you think the field has changed over the last five to ten years? Yeah, it's changed a lot. There's a lot of awareness around rare diseases, orphan diseases, which is very good. Mm -hmm. uh, very good. There are uh, more than 7,000 such small diseases around. Mm -hmm. I would say that our primary focus is not uh, the orphan per se. Mm -hmm. It's more the fact that here you have diseases, devastating diseases with a high unmet need. Yeah. Uh, and also, and maybe more importantly for us, diseases where you can uh, where you oftentimes have a better handle on the, um, the mechanistic features of disease, like you know the genetics, yes. or, you, or you know to a detail at the mechanistic level what is wrong in this disease. Whereas in larger diseases you often really do not know uh, what at the uh, tissue level or, or cellular level what actually goes wrong in the individual patients. Okay, yeah, I mean I wonder, like, I mean, why did you pick the specific ones that you're looking at? or? A few different reasons, and I think every biotech company at some point in time has to be opportunistic and, 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 and you know, make go for a good choice and not wait mm -hmm. for necessarily making a final decision on what is the uh, optimal choice. Mm -hmm. We had a few. Uh, our fundamental um, technology was developed for the treatment of a family of genetic diseases pediatric diseases called lysosomal storage disorders. Mm -hmm. And that relies on the fact that our scientific founder, he discovered that one of these heat shock proteins that we're yeah. applying, that they work specifically in the lysosomes. Okay. So lysosomes are these recycling units or, yeah. or bins in the cells where you degrade all the waste material. And when that machinery of degrading waste material doesn't work, then you build waste material mm. and cells become sick, degenerate, and, and that turns into a disease in, in many situations. So our technology was ideally fitted for, for lysosomal diseases and this is, has been a core focus from the beginning. We now have trials in two other diseases that are not 100% uh, genetic in nature, okay. but where we can see the same mechanisms apply as a fundamental part of the pathology, mm -hmm. namely uh, ALS and inclusion body myositis. Okay. Larger diseases that have sort of opened up to us after starting our own internal research. Okay. Um, so I know you um, had a very uh, um, decent um, 
IPO last year on the NASDAQ in Copenhagen um, was that um, you had, I, th I believe, raised 80, 80 million. Um, was that a figure you were hoping to raise, or I mean, was that higher, lower? I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, at the end of the day, it was exactly what we hoped to raise. Yeah. Um, we needed a lot of um, we needed a lot of capital to support four clinical trials. Uh, the best uh, way of raising that amount of, of capital was through an IPO, mm -hmm. so that's why we did it. Uh, it was a large IPO uh, for European standards, mm -hmm. and it took a lot of work. Work, sorry, but it was uh, it was more or less exactly as as we were aiming for. So okay, great. Very happy about that. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I know it's obviously a bit of a controversial question, but I mean, how easy is it to make money in the so that this orphan disease, orphan disease space, as it were? Well, we are still a development company, so yeah. I'll tell you in a few years. But <laughs> I mean, obviously, we have a business plan that makes sense to our shareholders, and um, and basically that relies on being able to, uh, at the end of the day, commercialize your product at a reasonable price. Mm -hmm. uh, we 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 know that we need to show in our clinical trials first mm -hmm. that we can do something meaningfully for the for these patients uh, that we're mm -hmm. treating, and after that, uh, yeah, we can have this discussion again. Yeah. But uh, in gen there is a business model that works for these diseases as well, and that's a good thing. Okay. So, I mean, I understand you talked about patients, and I, I think um, obviously um, in the orphan disease space, particularly, I guess they're very um, rare diseases. I mean, do you consult with patient groups? Very much so. Yeah. yeah. I think this is very important. Yeah. I mean, do they have much influence on what you're doing or your trials? Yeah, especially on the trial designs, yeah. yeah. Because, I mean, this, um, let's say, a good example is the, um, the trial that we just completed. We have a phase two, three trial in, in mm. Neiman Pick disease type C, a very rare mm. genetic disorder. And, uh, and that trial, <coughs> so, so these patients uh, suffer, devastating, suffer yeah. devastating disease. Uh, it's a degenerative disease. Not, you would not expect to be able to you know, uh, reverse the disease in these patients. Mm. However, we had discussions with the patient groups when we started about how do we do a trial design where we can actually reach a clinically meaningful signal um, you know, in a way that would be uh, that would work for you guys. And the problem here is, you need to enroll patients for a trial ongoing for 12 months. Mm -hmm. You need patients into a placebo group for 12 months. Uh, and the patient groups were, uh, you would expect that patients would be reluctant about mm. a 12 month placebo uh, controlled trial, but they were supportive because they saw the larger picture. We need to do the trial first mm. before we can have a treatment for for our kids and the patients are suffering from an even pig disease type C. And we would probably not have been able to, to th we, we, I, I mean, we'd definitely not be able to run this trial unless we'd had the full support of the patient community. Mm. But the support that we saw to do a proper trial yeah. was, was just uh, fantastic and, and a great help. And as I understand it, you're running the trial, it's, it's, ch it's a childhood disease, right? So you're, um, does that mean you have to, you presumably having to recruit children into the, into the trial? Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, how, were there any difficulties with that? Because that's obviously, can be challenging, I guess. It's very challenging. Yeah. And, I, and uh, I think that, that um, not just for the patients themselves, it's, it's obviously always uh, something different to work with kids in, uh, in pediatric diseases. But uh, when you think about it in a, in a, in a disease like this, it's not just uh, the child it's, uh, itself. Mm. It's very much the family that are affected. Mm -hmm. The family, the f full family needs to take time off to make sure that mm. the, the child can participate in a clinical trial. Uh, they need to dedicate sort of the full family resources on committing to being part of, uh, of a trial. So it's very much a, a very big undertaking for the families and something that cannot be overemphasized really because they are under stress and duress. Mm -hmm. Uh, from from the start, from the beginning. Yes. Mm. Um, well, um, I wonder if there's, you know, talk, we're obviously at a biotech conference, and I wonder if you have any advice for, um, you know, a new founder in the area or somebody who wants to set up a um, uh, a new company in the rare disease space. Well, if I haven't, well, I could probably speak for hours about. Uh, Let's pick one. Yeah, That's yeah, nice. yeah. But it, but I also think it's you know every case is is kind of unique. So I think. The basically, yes, you, you need to go for it and you, you need to keep the large perspective in mind at all times. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, at times you sort of, especially as a startup person, as an entrepreneur, you, you're sort of being drowned in work, you know, getting, do I have, do I have money to, to support the next three months of, of mm -hmm. development? Uh, all these nitty gritty communications with 
all sorts of different authorities. So you need to dedicate time to always think about what it is that you're trying to achieve at the end. Mm -hmm. You know, it'll always take 10 to 15 years. It always yeah. does. Uh, and, but if you forget that, then you will be, uh, you will be uh, lost and you will lose motivation along the way for sure. Okay. And what are your, um, just to maybe finish off, I mean, what are your plans for the future or the next get few years, do you think? <laughs> well, ours is pretty exciting at the moment. Now we have uh, we've come from academia, then we did full preclinical development. Now we have clinical trials and reaching, hopefully, uh, the stage where we'll have an approval of our first medicine within a year or two. So the next stage for us is to become uh, a, a company that commercializes markets, mm -hmm. medicines for these diseases. And, and we'll see that's the plan for the next couple of years. I would say another important step now is to is to work on our technology platform and bring new yeah. molecules forward okay. in other protein misfolding diseases. A lot of work ahead. Okay, great. Well, thank you ever so much for coming today and thank you for talking to me yeah. and uh, best of luck for the future. Thanks thank so much. You.